Hello, everyone. <clears throat> uh, we have just started uh, our uh, today's online telebridge, as we call it. So basically, uh, online debate roundtable on uh, the uh, regulation of, uh, of cannabis and recent de developments on, of different countries of the world. We can we can say <coughs> the telebridge is quite quite long because we we connect. Uh, uh, South Africa with with Europe basically, and uh, also with South America, right? So uh, in terms of length, both. in terms of of length, so of the telebridge, yeah? uh, we call or we titled the, the our um, our event Zapet uh, minut uh, in Czech. In English, it it means five minutes to t minute minutes to twelve, uh, which basically means in English, uh, in the last moment. Yeah, yeah it's a Czech we, saying. Yes, we also say in in Czech uh, five minutes after twelve, which means too late. And so we it it, it should it, it should say we still have a time to think to implement uh, the, the, the smart. Uh, regulation of, uh, of cannabis uh, uh, and we can think about it together today. Let me introduce myself. My name is Viktor Mravčík. I'm former <coughs> head of the National Monitoring Center for Drugs and Addictions in, in, in Czech Republic and uh, currently I'm uh, head of research in the Institute for Rational Drug Policies, which is the institution organizing this this event. And together with me, we have uh, six panelists. So let me very shortly uh, just introduce our our panelists, and then there will be more more more, more in details in introduction of, of them during the round uh, table. So we, we have uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Kathleen Claire, uh, Clark from South Africa. We have uh, Mr. Andrew Bonello from Malta. We have uh, Mr. Uh, Georg Wurt from Germany. Then we have uh, Mr. Julio Calzada from uh, Uruguay. And uh, last but not least, we have Mr. Inzik Vobozil from uh, from Czech Republic. Ah, no, and last but not least, finally, we have Mrs. Magdalena Domkowska, of, of course, from uh, from Poland. So six six panelists. Uh, uh, what to say at the beginning, uh, we will debate the regulation of cannabis, cannabis policies, but not only cannabis. We, we don't need to limit ourselves uh, just, to, just to cannabis, so we can discuss the substance uh, policies or drug drug policies and drug drug regulation. But of course, cannabis in the center of, of, of debates uh, nowadays. We are in the moment where after more than 60 years of, of uh, uh, drug uh, regulation within uh, UN conventions, uh, we see that the mm, regime of, of tough control or prohibition of substances uh, um, is quite limited. Uh, mm, uh, the goal of the of this regime hasn't been achieved. Uh, it's too ambitious, too unrealistic to simply uh, decrease substantially or eradicate the non-medical drug use and to achieve the drug uh, drug-free world. And uh, as a consequence of, of this. Uh, um, tough control regime prohibition. Uh, uh, there is uh, um, criminalization of, of of the ordinary people, drug users, including uh, including, for example, people who suffer fr uh, from substance uh, uh, use disorder. Uh, so. This is kind of framework, and, and, and of course we know there are smarter or more efficient way how to deal with the substances, with the regulation of substances, and this is the framework of, of our debate today. Uh, 
So let me let me pass the floor to to our first uh, panelist. Uh, maybe first about the format. About the format. So I would like to ask you, dear panelists, to uh, uh, after gi giving you the floor, to very shortly answer the questions or points of. Um, for debate, uh, I will I will raise really very shortly from three to five minutes to make it really short. And after this round table, we can have a debate among uh, I mean ours, uh, all of us on the interesting topics uh, uh, or topics of interest, which uh, I mean will be raised uh, by any of us. Yeah, so first. Uh, uh, first panelist is uh, Mrs. Um, Kathleen Clark. Uh, she is an executive director of Fields of Green for All, which is a non-profit organization that engages in cannabis activism and advocacy, and is a provider of evidence for cannabis-related uh, lawsuits. She works to change uh, public policy on cannabis laws in South Africa. So she is from South Africa, from Johannesburg. This nonprofit organization has been granted consultative status by the United Nations Economic and Social Council. Uh, Kathleen uh, has also a personal experience of the drug uh, persecution. Um, the, she um, were involved in a uh, in, in number of, uh, of cases personally, which has raised public awareness and, were, um, and, and, and triggered uh, the civil movement uh, towards the, the criminalization in South Africa. So please, um, dear uh, Mrs. Clark, dear, dear Kathleen, um, based on your personal experience with the drug control regime and with the law enforcement, um, can you describe maybe how the non-profit organizations like your organizations uh, can be or are involved in cannabis uh, education, advocacy, and in cannabis policy very shortly. And uh, uh, can you somehow summarize the recent developments in South Africa in this regard? Please. Hello, yes, thank you for including me in this discussion and I'm very proud to be here as an activist and as a South African and also as an African. So as you said, uh, Fields of Green, non-profit company as we call them here, was established in South Africa in 2013 to be the evidence provider for strategic litigation necessary to overcome the challenges we are faced uh, on the road to re-legalization of cannabis. With this comes the challenges of re-education after long decades of prohibition. And we work with all sectors, from local grassroots communities all the way up to, as you said, the United Nations. But by far the biggest challenge is the re-education of our government, uh, those people who actually make the law. On a personal level, you know, as you said, my work was uh, as an activist started when myself and my late partner, Julian, were arrested in our home in 2010. It's one thing to preach about the good of the plant and another to educate lawmakers on the harms of prohibition. That has always been my mission. Despite some progress here in South Africa, citizens are still arrested every day in our country. If you have money, the police will extort it from you. If you don't, they will steal your cannabis and throw you in jail. As a human being, I feel very strongly about the continued human rights abuses that are perpetuated across Africa. International companies flood our continent with investments for prescription cannabis to be exported for the health and well-being of the rich. Personally, my team and I are dedicated to building a brighter future for all in our cannabis community. However, it is a challenge to provide any good news in an environment where it is almost impossible to get new sectors off the ground. This is a resource-rich country and continent that is being plundered by the elite. 
So many of us have given so much for our, for our cannabis communities in Africa, and it's really difficult to watch cannabis becoming a resource to extract and export. I hope that my continued participation in discussions like this will maybe make a difference in this sector. As we say, it's five to 12. Um, I started this work uh, 13 years ago now, and um, we really are in the last rush to get this right. In 2018, the Constitutional Court of South Africa handed down a judgment declaring the prohibition of the private use and cultivation of cannabis within private spaces and constitutional. This was both the best and the worst judgment for us. It was the best because privacy is a supreme constitutional right. And it was the worst judgment because the judgment states explicitly that any trade in the cannabis plant will remain illegal. Now our government were given two years to amend the defects in the law and it is now five years since the judgment. This has created many gray areas which are being exploited by those with the education and position in society. I would say that we have had mixed success thus far. I believe that in general, a vast majority of South Africans understand cannabis far more than they did 10 years ago. You know, we've got the internet and we've all got websites and social media. So general public and their education is not so much as a, a, a priority. What I didn't know 10 years ago was that this was going to take so long. We now know that we have to fight this from so many different angles, one step at a time, eating the elephant one bite at a time. Ultimately, I've been out on bail for the last 12, almost 13 years. My case is still open in the Pretoria High Court. Both of my co-plaintiffs are deceased. If I have to find the resources to go back and take this issue all the way back to the Constitutional Court again, I will. But for now, we're kind of scratching around to find the good news down here on the southern tip of Africa. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, mixed feelings or mixed, uh, mixed, mixed, mixed success, uh, as you said, in South Africa. Uh, it means at least there is um, at least some partial movement towards uh, more just policies, yeah, I would say. Uh, we have heard about uh, South Africa at the beginning, so let's move to Malta and to listen to what's going on there, because there are things going on. Uh, so we have Mr. Andrew Bonello, uh, President of uh, Relief Malta, uh, uh, and this organization uh, from 2019 represents the voice of cannabis consumers in, in Malta. Uh, we know that there are recent changes uh, in Malta <laughs> towards decriminalization and some kind of legal supply yeah, of, of, of cannabis. Um, Andrew is interested in issues related to cannabis, human rights, public health, uh, regulation, I guess. He advocates for a fairer, more human and decriminalized and regulated ap approach to, to cannabis. So, uh, Andrew, uh, very shortly, can you summarize the uh, situation in in Malta, uh, maybe a bit introduce the the um, the most important elements of your of your regulation there, and uh, uh, how is it with uh, with the decriminalization uh, of uh, uh, growing for for personal use or possession, and how is that with the I would say, uh, regulated supply of, of, of cannabis for con consumers. So please. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this round table. I'm honored to be here. Um, as you correctly said, yes, at the end of um, 2021, the Maltese Parliament passed a law. Um, actually, it amended the Malta Dangerous Drugs Ordinance Act 
And this sends out a strong message in favor of promoting a non-criminalized approach for personal cannabis consumers and cultivators, and is an in initial encouraging first step to ensure the negative measures and human rights abuses of the past are replaced by an evidence-based system placing the health, the privacy, and the well-being of cannabis consumers at the helm of, of all decision-making. The partial decriminalization of cannabis and water has been hailed as an important and bold step by drug policy experts all around the world and is in keeping with the human rights based approach dealing with realities from the ground. Our not for profit approach places people and the community at the center of policy with civil society playing a pivotal role in this process. While the law is de jure, we are still in the initial implementation phase of this reform, but civil society organizations like the one I represent welcome Malta's dis, um, direction to introduce a social justice framework to address the negative unintended consequences of criminalization. As you correctly said, um, we have now been permitted or Maltese citizens will no longer be subject to criminal prosecution for the personal cultivation of up to four plants and the personal possession of up to seven grams in public. This, of course, is a very important amendment that protects consumers from the devastating consequences of criminalization, which in too many cases has led also to incarceration. Walter's framework of introducing a regulated market will come as a non-profit, members-only associations where cannabis can be cultivated and shared with best practices being encouraged. This approach provides consumers with a safety net and acts as an important hub where to exchange information and seek help when and if needed. The act of sharing cannabis and of meeting in a group of friends to share a common interest is a strong harm reduction tool. And it is one which favors a collective and a community as opposed to a moralistic approach to the use of mind altering substances. These safe spaces aim to promote the well-being of the members through different health, social and legal tools, yet do not promote or market the use of cannabis. This model is a bottom-up approach spearheaded by civil society organizations, denouncing the injustices suffered under the persistent prohibitionist regimes and advocating for the protection of human rights for people who use cannabis. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, uh, you have tackled the, the issue of de decriminalization. Uh, maybe all of us uh, would like to know more about uh, the legal supply, I would say, of cannabis for adult consumers, but we can come back to that uh, in our discussion. So uh, now let's move from Malta to another uh, European country. Um, uh, in the center of Europe, or in the cent I mean, in the center of continent, uh, we know that uh, there are a number of initiatives in Europe uh, uh, looking for the uh, mm, uh, changes or more smart uh, ways of uh, cannabis uh, regulation. There is Switzerland, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Spain, Czechia, which we will hear later, but among others also Germany, one of the biggest uh, European uh, country. Uh, um, there are very recent uh, movements and, and changes also on the highest levels of, of the policy. All of us are, are observing. Um, uh, government announced an effort to leg legalize cannabis for recreational use or for adult use. So, uh, what what is the current situation in Germany? We will ask Mr. George uh, Georg, yeah, in, in, in German, Georg Wurt, uh, activist, uh, owner of the German Cannabis Association, the largest organization of the cannabis rights movement in Germany. He managed to win, this is interesting, I have read that before, to win uh, one million euro prize of the German TV show Millionaire 
to support advocacy for uh, legalization efforts uh, in, in Germany. So, please, Georg, tell us uh, uh, from your point of view, uh, again, the basic element of, ge of the recent German approach and the, the strategy um, just discussed in Germany towards uh, cannabis legal uh, regulation. And uh, how do you see uh, the, this model of uh, or proposal for, for regulation also in context of EU and maybe EU, uh, EU law? Uh, and uh, what's the prospects of forward, uh, the way forward uh, and maybe alternatives you can see? Yeah. The floor is yours. Point of time uh, to have this panel here after last week's uh, announcement uh, of our health minister. Um, I'm very keen on hearing what you, especially the Czech colleagues, uh, are saying about it. Uh, it's a little bit like um, we uh, left you alone uh, with the plan to legalize. <laughs> um, I'm not talking too much about uh, why to legalize and so on. I think uh, I have, don't have to convince anybody of you. We are all legalizers here. I'm doing this since 25 years and following the development. Um, and we all together are now at a point where the world is um, changing the view to cannabis policy and uh, slowly the first uh, wins are made, let's say. Um, but also we see now the practical burdens and hurdles and so on uh, of making really big steps. All of us uh, have that kind of problem. We uh, are in countries who are who said they are reformers, they have goals and uh, want changes um, and don't get forward really, uh, or very, very slowly. Um, all right, and, and Germany is probably not the country uh, someone would have thought to be one of the leading legalized countries in the last uh, decades, let's say, with conservative ch chancellors and so on. I long, long I thought which country will be the first to legalize in Europe uh, and I never thought it's Germany um, and probably we won't. So the new announcement, the um, second version of the plan of the German government is not to legalize cannabis anymore in this um, election period until 2025. Um, and they say it's not possible because of EU law. When I say legalizing um, cannabis in Germany, the full plan, I'm talking about having uh, shops special shops to distribute cannabis to every adult who wants. So the Malta model, I won't uh, call legalization in this kind, uh, in, in this sense. Um, but still, Malta, sure, is the most liberal country now in Europe regarding the uh, paragraphs, let's say, uh, like real uh, decriminalization, like real legal possession and growing and so on. Um, and now Germany goes that way. Uh, the new plan is uh, to decriminalize um, 25 grams uh, to own in public, um, to grow three plants, three blooming plants. Uh, so probably you can have uh, smaller ones on, on top. Um, kind of a social clubs like Malta. Um, so I'm very keen on hearing more practical uh, issues about uh, the, the very harsh regulations in Malta and uh, it seems like uh, nobody will do this uh, under these circumstances um, and well maybe I'm wrong and <coughs> still there are, there's interest um, but maybe not so, and also Czech Republic what are you saying the second part of the new plan is to make model uh, regions this is uh, on top of Malta um, to say we have regions where every adult can buy cannabis in a shop, a fully commercialized um, system with legal production and so on, like the further plan, but uh, the, the earlier plan, but only in regions and only as a model project. So it's not an official real legalization and it's uh, limited in time, but it's not limited in persons. This is a new thing, uh, like in Switzerland, uh, we have a um, couple of hundreds of people in the um, tests and in Germany, 
regarding how many regions and cities um, can take part, uh, we are maybe talking about millions of uh, consumers. Um, the German government says this is possible uh, with EU law. I'm not sure about it. They say you must um, have a look on it and must have they, that say. And such a big uh, project, well, if they have to go in their um, confidential um, talks with the EU Commission they had, well, then it's interesting, let's say, um, but still it's a, it's a game stopper for real legalization efforts in Europe like Czech Republic. And uh, so I'm keen on hearing, did you also have this kind of um, confidential and um, non-public talks with the EU Commission where they, um, in this circumstance, said you are not allowed to legalize, like like uh, Luxembourg, the same story, no, nothing uh, written in a letter or something like the uh, EU Commission says it's not possible to legalize cannabis uh, officially. They still say, well, uh, we have no say about it as long as no country comes up with a law we can prove. Uh, and, and Germany says, well, they said it's not possible. Did they say it also to Czech Republic? I'm interested in hearing this. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We will hear about the Czech Republic uh, later. Uh, and Jensik will prepare the answer for your question, of course. Uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Mr. Julio Calzada. Uh, so he is from... Uh, from Uruguay, from uh, he's a director of the social policies department of the office of Montevideo and the secretary general of the National Council on, on Drugs. And uh, uh, he will talk about uh, experience, basically, experience from, from Uruguay, because as, as we know, Ur Uruguay has uh, implemented a legal regulation model for, for cannabis and basically adopted in 2013 and uh, in force uh, since 2014. So please, uh, Mr. Uh, or Julio, let me, let me say, uh, can you can you share with us the experience uh, from from Uruguay to shortly summarize the recent development and may, maybe debate on the adjustment of the model and and uh, about your your experience uh, since uh, that times and uh, maybe because this is part of the discussion here in Europe uh, like consequences of the legal supply. Yeah. What is your observation as regards the outcomes for the, for example, prevalence of cannabis use and prevalence of risky cannabis use or problematic cannabis use? So how 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 it changed after the legalization? So thank you. The floor is yours. Microphone probably. Are you on, Mr. Mattel? We cannot Mattel? hear you. We cannot hear you. Uh, so, the model. Oh. It's a model of regulation in Uruguay. In uh, three columns, which is plantation, uh, disponibilidad. So the system of pharmacies It's a form that we can uh, reach as a model of uh, legal cannabis. Bien, a ver, continuamos. Dice que uh, 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 the, the development of the of the industry has been stopped a little bit. Um, U.S. Since 2001, uh, the U.S. allowed some bank accounts that were linked to drug. Uh, the drug issue in Uruguay, everything, uh, all these, all these topics is legal and is regulated. The banks in the UN, for example, the the companies that want to develop in this industry, 
They allow them to have accounts. They don't interfere in their accounts. So this generates a market that is legal no? and it functions outside the banking system. This is, this is one of the difficulties that we have experienced in the last 10 years. In Uruguay, we can have the people person can have 40 grams of, of cannabis in general. They distribute it through pharmacies or through clubs. Even 10 grams a week can be distributed in this means. And they can have in the house, they can have 480 grams per person because it's 40, 40 grams per month. As I say, they can, they can grow up to six plants and the clubs can grow up to 99 plants in a determined period of time. They cannot have more than 99 plants in flower or in blossom. The experience is, well, different depending of from what point of view you look at it. Several 200,000 users in a country with 3.5 million inhabitants gives them the possibility of legal access. There is a system of registry. They have to register as cultivators. Also, when they go to the pharmacy, obtain the gloves, the, the drug, and also when they go to the clubs. The experience we have is that there is a hardcore group of people who access cannabis on a monthly level, a monthly basis. There's about 60,000 of them doing this. And there is also a more extensive core of people, around 200,000, as I mentioned, that access cannabis through a third person. It's a blue market, it's called here in, in Uruguay. Gray market as well, referred to as gray market. The person that access cannabis is not because they buy it through legal means, but because they're invited to join or to, or to consume it. When I talk about 200,000 people, this is the annual prevalence. People who go to a party or they join friends in a party or something, they, are not, they don't acquire the drug through the three available legal means. They're a little bit forgotten, they're invited for those who are part of the system or who are registered in the system, of them, this, who are part of this mature system. The experience and the results after nine years of implementing, well, 10 years, it's going to be now in December, 10 years, of the law being approved, nine years of it being implemented. So in January, it was nine years of this year, of 2023. The experiences or the feedback we received is, is varied. On the one hand, the objective of the law was to get rid of or, or minimize or, or decrease the black market to some extent, the illegal market, reduce it as much as possible or to, start, to some extent. This was achieved to very broad extent, illegal marijuana in Uruguay, which is called Perensado Paraguayo, that's the term. It's not marijuana that doesn't circulate, it's, not, it's the flowers that are that are pressed and packed. They come from Paraguay, that's why they call Paraguayo. It exists, but it's very minor. So this market is, is virtually not, not there, it's, it's, it's disappeared virtually. This brings, there's 20 million of dollars that used to circulate in the legal market today are part of the regulated market. This is a very significant aspect of the success of the, of the new law. The second aspect is that the, the people who use drugs in the legal market today, they do not have to, to go to criminal organizations to access this market, which obviously has caused a decrease in violence, considerable decrease in violence. 
in the country. And finally, to look at it from a broader point of view, I would say that the, the most discussed aspects or topics that are discussed in every country related to regulation, as we refer to it, legalization, sometimes we refer to it as legalization, that this should um, consumption is absolutely not the experience of, of Uruguay, has not happened, not at all. Since the moment regulation was approved, the, the increase of use of cannabis did not shoot up, did not go up, there was no explosion of consumption. It's, it's, on a, it's going up slowly, but there is no sharp increase, shooting up the consumption, it's not happening. And even we have observed that the growth, the level of growth is decreasing slowly. In 2001, 2002, the growth was high, and now it's gone, it's sort of leveling, leveling out. Some of the positive aspects that was suspected, which was discussed by those who were or, or the fear they had, the politicians, when more regulation came, that adolescents were going to start consuming at high levels, that there was going to be a great increase in, in consumption of adolescents, it hasn't been the case. The opposite, the prevalence decreased among, among adolescents, among young people. However, we have seen an increase in the risk, in risk behavior. Regulation created, seemed to have created this. They can, this can be observed from different points of view, since this is not a forbidden substance, so young people don't, don't feel attracted to what is forbidden. And those who are dealing with public policy have observed that young people have in, are more inclined to consume in more dangerous substances such as crystal meth, MDA, and other different more dangerous drugs, more design, design drugs. What we have noticed, and this is important, is that there is an increase, a considerable increase in consume, consumption of people of above 30 years of age. From 30 to 40 years of age, we have seen an increase in consumption, significant increase in consumption of cannabis. We have seen this, the reasons might be one of them, because consumers those who register now are those who were not registered before when the drug was illegal. And it was difficult to obtain any information from the consumers. Another reason could be that now those people making use of their freedom and in the same manner as they, they consume alcohol or, or smoke that are a bit older, and uh, marijuana is not so risky, so they use it. Another aspect, just to close down, is that the regulation in, in Uruguay covers the whole system from, from um, import to export, to co uh, import, consumption, export, cannabis, from industrial um, use, medical use, recreational, and also for own consumption. Thank you very much for for this information and basically lessons learned from from Uruguay. It's very interesting because it's it's uh, for those who are planning the um, regulation efforts. It's important to listen to those who who already experienced that, uh, and uh, as, as you said, uh, the, there was no explosion of the problem with, with cannabis in, in Uruguay. This is consistent with the findings of the review studies looking at different jurisdictions around the world, uh, I would say experimenting or implementing the uh, different regulation models. Uh, <clears throat> maybe uh, we'll come back to that uh, soon in the discussion.
Now, <clears throat> now I would like to pass the floor to Mr. Inzik Vobořil, who is uh, the Czech Drug Coordinator, Czech National Drug Coordinator, Coordinator for Drug Policy, <clears throat> for the second time. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I would say his uh, his profession, his basic profession, is uh, manager of a uh, big organization providing services to people with substance use disorder and he is also a therapist himself um, and now he is the highest Czech stakeholder stake state state uh, stakeholder I would say promoting the uh, cannabis uh, reforms and not only cannabis towards decriminalization and uh, legal regulation. So please, Inzich, uh, I see the paper is full of notes here, but can you share with us uh, the recent development where we are in Czech Republic in process and in, uh, in the setting of the, of the model of regulation of, of cannabis? You didn't for forget Magda. Magda is going to be the last one, yes? As a, with the final I, said, one. I said the last again, yeah? Sorry? That you are the last speaker, yeah? I said. Uh, no, 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 I'm not sure, but no, that's no. about it. I'll speak yeah, and, uh, and uh, okay. the final uh, yeah, yeah. Word, word from Magda, uh, from Lady. Well, uh, uh, I would like to start and stress with the an underline, uh, it was said already before, what is prohibition from my point of view? Prohibition is a an harsh and cruel, maybe sometimes or very often a social experiment which never worked. Whether we tried it with alcohol, we tried it with tobacco, and, uh, and now we have it globally with other substances. And it doesn't work. And it doesn't deliver what it promised. 1998, uh, United Nations claimed, well, free of drugs, we can do it. And by 2008, we were supposed to um, have wealth free of drugs. Uh, by 2008, the, the, the number of drug users and number of consum and the consumption doubled. And from that time, it tripled. So um, uh, prohibition doesn't work. Uh, I'm a therapist. I work with uh, people with addictions. And also, I'm at this moment a decision maker in, in government. So these two experience, experiences tell me that we have to find other way. <clears throat> so this is the, what I want to start with. We need to find something that really works. And do we know what works? Yes, we do. We have the experience with legal substances. We had an epidemic after the Second World War. I looked uh, two days ago at the, at the cure of, uh, a very sharp epidemic of tobacco, and then it stopped, and it's declining. Why? Because we regulate it. With cannabis, it's going up. We have prohibition, and it's going up. We forbid it. We put people to, to prisons for long sentences. Some countries, uh, people are put to death, and it's going up. So, uh, so we have to do something else if we want to think preventively. The current government, uh, Czech government, decided to to and put it in its um, uh, program approved by parliament, uh, saying that we will regulate addictive substances according to their risks, uh, whether it is uh, uh, alcohol, tobacco, and nicotine products, or whether it is drugs that are currently illegal or new drugs that are coming. So we are looking for ways of uh, regulating uh, the substances according to their risks. And uh, when we talk about cannabis itself, we know that the risks are there, but they are not as high as many other drugs, including some of the legal ones, like alcohol. Uh, so we decided to, to put together a government commission, but first maybe I should say that already two years ago we legalized uh, without any big uh, noise, we legalized um, cannabis uh, with 1% uh, 
up to 1% of THC and it's everywhere in the Czech Republic and nothing happened. Uh, there is no, no big noise around it, no European Parliament um, uh, or European um, uh, uh, court is going against it. So what is the difference between uh, allowing 12%, 80%, 18%? I, I don't see it. Uh, 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 see the difference. But we are trying to, uh, the, the question of my German colleagues, we are trying to look at this, yes. <clears throat> but first I, I'll try to say where we head into and what is in our proposal at this moment. In our proposal we have uh, three ways of access to, to cannabis. First, uh, home growing. We already talked about it, how home growing looks in different countries and what's in what's plan, what's been, what is in the plan in German government, for example. We have a um, uh, idea of cannabis social clubs. Uh, I am a fund of cannabis social clubs. I think it's a very uh, interesting harm reduction tool. When I first heard it, 2012 or something, uh, I not heard it, but started talking about it. Uh, I was not much fond of it, but then I went to Barcelona. I'm a member of one cannabis social club. I'm not a user at all. I don't even drink alcohol or caffeine, but uh, but uh, but I am a member of one particular cannabis social club. I went around different cannabis social clubs, and I think it's a it's a very interesting tool. Uh, in terms of harm reduction, we can discuss it later. And then we have a plan to, to, to have commercial production and uh, commercial sale, but very limited. So uh, in our, uh, in, in the, when we start with, uh, with the commercial production, we, we want licensed um, uh, Companies, we don't want to limit number of licenses, but uh, everybody will have to to fit with some uh, regu uh, certificates, regulations, and uh, they will uh, have to pay some fee. Uh, and of course, uh, we we were debating a, a level of THC in products. So we uh, at this moment uh, we're talking about two ways of limiting. One is 18 or 20 percent of uh, THC in the plant and then we're talking about milligrams in uh, in extracts. Uh, then uh, then uh, when we talk about a sale uh, we have two in our proposal two ways. Uh, one is through pharmacies and the other one is through uh, specialized shops that we can call uh, uh, dispensaries, for example, such as, such as that we know in from Thailand, for example, or other other countries, um, which are going to be licensed shops against, uh, not not uh, shops with that that can uh, not a usual shop. Uh, uh, the the question of the how we resolve the the European Court situation. We have a st statement of the uh, lawyers of Ministry of Foreign Affairs, especially the department that uh, represents uh, the country in front of the court courthouse, in the European courthouse. And they say that we have a, uh, we found a legal uh, uh, way of going forward uh, that uh, that, will, that will be based on deep analyzation. Uh, uh, of course, it it's, has a lot of complication. No, we didn't ask informally European Commission. We we know that Germany did it, so there was no reason for us to do it. And we want to set. I mean, me personally, I'm pushing for. Uh, the, our government to set the law and then go forward if uh, if there is any any legal case around it um i don't know maybe about the process where we are now uh well uh we set a uh, expert commission that uh, i well i should say that i am directly accountable to the prime minister um and uh, 
I am also a deputy executive of the government advisory body for uh, addictions, which is alcohol, gambling, tobacco and other drugs. <coughs> uh, because the white deputy, executive deputy, because the, 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 the chair um, is the prime minister. And, and the members of ministers and, and some other uh, professionals. Uh, so uh, now we set uh, the, a, an expert a separate commission that already developed uh, the proposal and the proposal is going to basically go to government debate at this moment. So we're not in the parliament yet, but we, we are in the political debate. So far the agreement was that uh, I am communicating, I'm the only person communicating this on behalf of the government to the media. But uh, when when it goes to through the government, then there will be other other players uh, discussing it. So uh, our idea is to 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 draft uh, the law uh, by the end of uh, summer and in autumn uh, send it to the parliament. If we are successful, we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, it's quite a difficult process, and we are still in the middle of that, I would say. Uh, let's continue with the... We'll come back to, uh, to different aspects of, of uh, uh, regulation efforts in debate, I hope. And uh, what's the plan of this debate, basically? It should last one, one hour? Two hours. Two hours. Yeah. Great, so we have enough time. Uh oh yes, yes. Uh, maybe the people in studio can can inform us uh, in this regard. But anyway, let's uh, go back to our roundtable. So the last uh, panelist is Mrs. Magdalena Dombkowska from Poland. Uh, she's the expert in uh, human rights, uh, uh, and human rights uh, have been mentioned many times uh, already by previous speakers. Um, she is the coordinator of the drug policy program at the Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights in Poland. Uh, and uh, she is advocating for drug policy reforms and providing strategic advice to civil society groups and organizations, not only in Poland, but uh, in Europe uh, as, uh, as a whole uh, and uh, also she is one of the consultants to the Polish uh, Psychedelic Society, Society and we know that psychedelics are another group of substances uh, which are under debate uh, as regards regulation of, uh, of uh, uh, possession of them and uh, and using that in different contexts. So please, Magdalena, share with us your views, your experience from the uh, human rights expert point of view. Thank you very much. And right now, the, the moment of truth, I very much hope you can hear me. Yes, yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much for the invitation and actually for the possibility to share a um, human rights perspective because uh, it's been often missing in the, in the discussions about drug policy, in the decision-making processes, that perspective is often missing. So I'm glad that I can share that. And I'm also glad that I'm speaking as the last one, actually. We heard stories from different parts of the globe uh, and um, I, I'm happy to offer um, a little bit of an overarching maybe rights, human rights perspective and, um, uh, and background. Uh, because after 15 years of uh, my work, my experience um, in the field, I dare to say that so far the prohibitionist regime, so that drug policy model that we see around the globe, the so-called war on drugs, which is in practice the war against people and human rights, uh, lie on two opposite poles which should not be the case. Um, and when we even move back in time to the moment when the war on drugs was declared, we will see that racism, that discrimination, which are definitely located in opposition to human rights then followed, of course, by ignorance for scientific evidence, they laid the foundations 
for the violence, the brutality that we see today, the irrational and disproportionate responses of the states towards the phenomenon of drug use and to all human rights violations that we can see committed until today in the name of achieving society free of drugs as Injik mentioned, in the name of our safety, security, of our health protection. But this is really important when we discuss the future models to, to stop here and to ask ourselves, what do we mean by our safety, our health? What do we mean by ours? Whose safety and whose well, and whose well-being, sorry? Is it the safety of a person brutally stopped by the and searched by the police because of their skin color? Is it the safety of a person sentenced, often without a fair trial, for death, for drug uh, possession, or any other drug-related crimes? We still have 35 countries around the world that do have death penalty for drugs crimes. Is it the safety of um, human rights defenders pro-democratic activists or free media journalists operating under, under authoritarian regimes who are incarcerated on the basis of false accusations of drug possession, safety or health of a person who is denied life-saving um, services, harm reduction services, for the sake of an illusionary concept of society free of drugs. Or is it the health of a chronically ill patient who is, I dare to say, tortured but not having their uh, pain treated and managed adequately due to the widespread opioidophobia? So the war on drugs leads to numerous, numerous human rights violations around the globe, and it has many more negative consequences for our lives that one would immediately think about. And it surely does a lot of harm, more than drug use itself, instead of working towards our health and safety. I actually cannot imagine any war uh, which could bring us uh, health and safety. So um, my opinion on today's situation and the war on drugs is short and clear. It should end immediately. And I'm glad to uh, see and to hear uh, more and vo more voices going into that direction and supporting that view on different levels, on national levels, at the UN level as well, which is the one that adopts changes uh, pretty slowly. But when we even look at what happened this year already at the annual um, session of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, the CND, uh, um, this is the commission that meets annually. And uh, in March of this year, for the first time ever, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights addressed the opening of the CND and clearly spoke about the need to end the war on drugs and to put human rights at the center of the global response to the uh, drug situation. Uh, also earlier this month, uh, the UN Human Rights Council adopted its most ambitious and progressive resolution on drug policy, which addresses um, the systemic racism, which reaffirms the rights of indigenous people um, to their traditional medicines and health practices, and finally, it uses the term harm reduction, which should be something um, obvious, but actually this is the uh, first time when a uh, um, politically negotiated UN resolution on drug policy clearly uh, uh, says harm reduction. Uh, so this is something that we, I myself and we, meaning the human rights movement, criticize the war, the war on drugs is not the direction that we want to follow. We've been stuck in that place for too long. We've, uh, we've, been, we've had enough years uh, to collect the evidence and to understand this is not the path we should follow. Uh, what are the alternatives? Uh, I, be, I believe we'll discuss that in the course uh, of, this, um, of this round table. Uh, for sure, this is, um, I would like to see the situation when uh, drug policies are rooted in human rights, uh, when uh, they take into account the scientific evidence and people's dignity, and uh, then uh, I believe we'll come into the course of the uh, conversation to talk about the practicalities from the legal perspective and, um, and others. Hmm.
Thank you, Magdalena. Just let, let me say, as you rightly said, uh, war on drugs it continues, actually. We don't call it war on drugs any, anymore, but it's still the Putin style of military operation, isn't it? <laughs> yes, when, when we, exactly when we look at the at other wars, like armed conflict, it was somewhat uh, shocking to hear that argumentation for the um, for the armed um, attack of Russia on Ukraine. Drugs were used as uh, as the re as one of the reasons, at least in in the narrative that uh, Russia's president presented. So we are that's in shocking. the in the in the situation of military operation against drugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and this is true also for for our countries here in Europe. Yeah, still, I mean, also in in the cases where it's not no. necessary. Yeah, so uh, it's very often it's kind of uh, demonstration of, of of power of the system. Yeah keeping this uh, control regime. Of course, we are discussing that on the margin of our uh, regulation efforts in Czech Republic as well, this uh, decriminalization or de decreasing the, the, the penalties and the effort of law enforcement agencies towards people using drugs, especially cannabis. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for this first round of, uh, of uh, information and uh, mm, uh, uh, remarks uh, from your uh, sides, from your point of view. My <coughs> phone just locked. Okay, I have to open. Arrangement for the for the rest of our, our debate. Let's uh, let's have really uh, a debate uh, among ourselves. Uh, in the meantime, I receive one by one the questions from chat. So maybe we should uh, we should announce to those who listen to and watch our uh, our debate that they can uh, ask the questions or put remarks uh, in the in the chat. Uh, and I will, I mean, in the right moment of the discussion, I will pick uh, some of them and and ask uh, our. Our panelists, um, how to how to arrange our debate now? Um, well, um, there are a number of uh, important aspects of uh, of um, legalization, decriminalization efforts. Yeah, we have heard about the human rights as uh, important package of uh, of. Uh, uh, of arguments, um, then public health arguments for the legalization and also as a consequence of our efforts to, to monitor, right? Then we have uh, discussed uh, already uh, some legislative or constitutional, uh, con I would say, correlates <laughs> of, of, uh, of the uh, regulation models also in Europe with regards to EU law and EU legal framework, right? Which is which is important. Then uh, uh, also I would say economic arguments, so costs and, and benefits of, of what we do now and what uh, what is uh, uh, possible to do or what what we plan in our efforts, and then. There are a lot of market elements and uh, and arguments how to design the 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 supply or the different options for for consumers to to grow or to get the cannabis uh, for the consumption and so on and so on. So there are a number of topics to to be discussed. And maybe I would like you, dear panelists, to think about what you are interested in to discuss among among this uh, distinguished group of, of panelists and to ask the, the questions to others or to raise the point to be discussed uh, in, in this in this group. So uh, if there is any of you Thinking about about this kind of of question to be discussed from Germany, at, at, the, at the beginning. So, Georg, please.
Yeah, thank you. Um, this uh, question to Mr. Uh, Boboril, is that uh, quite right? Yes. <laughs> Pronounced, sorry. Um, you said um, your law department has a strategy how to legalize uh, and get the regulation in the legal framework of uh, international law by a strategy of deep penalization. Uh, did I forget that right? Um, that sounds not like legalization. That sounds not like um, it's completely legal, for example, to produce um, cannabis as a recreational drug in the uh, Czech Republic. It's still illegal, but it's not punished or something like that. Uh, can you explain this strategy, um, deep penalization ground um, yes. and on that? I'm not, you I'm, get not, yes, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm trying to understand it myself because we had uh, three ways possible going forward. Uh, one was legally, one was the the question of technical cannabis, as it's called, another possibility to say, okay, we people, people, I'm simplifying this, people will register and uh, it's, uh, it's, a, 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 um, it's a health product, let's say, uh, for people who want to use so they don't use from the illegal market. And the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs came with a new concept uh, when they looked in the international convention, especially the 1961 convention, the 1961 con uh, convention mentions a paragraph that allows um, 90, 1988, okay, mm -hmm. correction, uh, I have from Victor, uh, allows, uh, uh, allows a, uh, has a paragraph that speaks about the country's uh, 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 ways of regulating and, and it allows depenalization uh, for for users, if I understand right? Well, uh, I mean, uh, the, it, it's the same as with this uh, country framework decision of, of, of EU law, basically. Yeah? This 1988 convention simply allows countries, according to their constitutional principles, to not to punish yes. as an offense uh, or behavior related to personal consumption yeah and uh, th this we know of course yeah this is basis for any decriminalization of the uh, personal or possession and, and, and use uh, for, uh, or possession or um, cultivation for personal yes. use but Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the lawyers came with the idea to make it the basis for the uh, European court kind of uh, legal Con construction, yes. Yeah, for so, the construction uh, of the supply. Yes, so so they say that this can actually stand against the, any accusation in the European Court, and we can win the we can win the the, co the case. Uh, and uh, well, the whole construct says that uh, we have an other way of. Uh, of regulating, which we do, of course, we do want to regulate substances uh, such as cannabis, not but not in the prohibition way. And if I want to, um, uh, but I would have to have the the, the, the legislators here to, to explain it in details. Yes, so uh, <clears throat> uh, it it's a big debate uh, in t internally as well in Czech Republic among different ministries, but not everybody. Uh, agrees with this uh, co uh, construct or uh, this uh, this uh, legal way forward, but um, uh, uh, because the minister minister of foreign affairs stands behind this decision, I think this will be the main basis uh, going forward with this. I don't know if I'm explaining it enough. I think it's very very specific. Uh, specific legal question. Yeah, so simply they propose to, to, to have this depenalization option as a starting point for the whole construct uh, for the Czech uh, model. Right. And uh, it has a lot of... Uh, if we leave, uh, leave the consumers alone and don't punish them, we must uh, provide a possibility yes. uh, for the supply or something like that, yes. right? Yeah. Um, oh. At the end, it's uh, probably about uh, having leaders uh, who really push it through and go to the court and um, challenge uh, the Commission and the EU uh, and then 
bring it to the point while uh, Luxembourg and the German uh, ministries um, or ministers like Lauterbach, health minister, <coughs> is not doing this, just uh, having little talks and they say, well, it's not possible and he says, well, all right, then I don't do it. Uh, so we never get a real uh, decision by the European court or something, uh, what's possible and what is not. Um, and so if you don't get it done uh, in your case, then it might be really the European Commission. And in our case, uh, it's our health minister who stopped legalization. So good luck with this uh, to get to that point, uh, your leaders uh, really going into the end to the court and so on. Um, and uh, well, maybe Czech Republic paves the way and shows how it goes, um, would be nice. Yes, that's, uh, that's my plan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those, those efforts, uh, especially in Europe, having this EU framework uh, is kind of pioneering, yeah? pioneering. So uh, there is no experience from real cases to, or just, just little you can refer to. So uh, yes, you are right. Uh, Maybe for our colleagues from uh, South Africa and uh, Uruguay to explain uh, uh, what what is on stake, yes? Because if we, as Uruguay experienced, um, uh, if you are in uh, some kind of a conflict with international conventions, and the INCB keeps saying Uruguay is outside, Canada is outside of the conventions, Nothing actually serious can happen because the sanctions that uh, would be taken are none, actually. But in, in uh, uh, Europe, and especially the Schengen space, it's pro more problematic because the European law is based on international law. So uh, our governments are breaking heads over this, this, this issue. If our country is put in the European court, uh, what, what, and we will lose the case, what will happen? Uh, actually, what could only happen is that the European Commission will stop some funding. So that's the sanction which is not directly mentioned in the European law, but that can be the implication. So, uh, so this, is, this is the whole issue, so that's why I think we should be more bold and go ahead and uh, and say, okay, let's try the court. And if we lose, okay, will will commission stop uh, funding for something? Um, and then, okay, we should start thinking how to reverse the the law if if this uh, all is happening. And I think this, but um, I would be happy if I see and I will try to lobby in Germany uh, in, with the ministers to support our effort, even though. Germany doesn't want to go forward with it, but it would be good to say, okay, let's try this case. Let's Czech Republic will support this case. Let's study this case and see what happens. So this would at least help. So if any effort from your side could be towards, okay, Czech Republic wants to, to try the, the precedents, uh, let's help them to, to try, that would, that would also help. Yeah, at the beginning of your speech now, there was a question to, to some other speaker, wasn't it? No, no. No, okay. no, I just said because I, I, I'm thinking that uh, our colleagues from South Africa and, and, uh, and uh, Uruguay might not know why we are so concerned with European yeah, law, yeah. because uh, okay. the international conventions don't, uh, we can kind of uh, break it, let's say, yes, because it's, although we don't want to break international laws, but uh, this is uh, outdated law that caused more damage, and this is how we see it. But uh, but we are in conflict with European law at the same time. Our colleague from uh, South Africa and, and then Magda is good. Uh, Magdalena, oh, so first, uh, yes. yeah, okay. please, Kathleen. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to Magdalena for um, broadening our, our perspective and speaking about the large issue of, of human rights. We certainly, as, as some of the other colleagues on the panel, we were all in Vienna in March for CND. And may I please recommend a paper written by 
independent drug policy researcher, Kenzie Ribolet-Zomuli. It is called High Compliance, and it is all about countries' compliance with the international treaties. Because here in South Africa, we certainly have it thrown at us all the time that we have to comply with the reporting requirements of the INCB. Um, now, here at Fields of Green for All, we call the INCB, well, a watchdog with a spreadsheet. And what are the consequences if we saw, um, if we do the same as Uruguay, for example? But here in South Africa, we are in an incredibly unique position where there are lots of issues that are facing us that do not face European countries or even some South American countries in, in, in lots of ways. And um, so this, this issue of, of plant counting is one of the things that, that always comes up for us because uh, here in South Africa, we've been growing cannabis for over 700 years. And, um, and, and it is very much part of our traditions and our cultures. And it's endemic here in the southern parts of South Africa. We have the perfect climate. We have the perfect altitudes above sea level for our major rural growing areas. Now, this issue of plant counting, I, I took note that in Malta, um, you are allowed four plants, uh, 99 plants for a club in Uruguay, so many plants here and so many plants there. Now, my big question, and it was my question when I appeared in Parliament here in South Africa too, is who is going to count those plants? The police are presumably coming to count those plants. And if we call it decriminalization or we call it depenalization, a current draft law that is before our parliament is going to penalize people who have more than eight plants with 15 years in prison. So now if you go down to Pondo land, which is one of our main growing areas, and you stand on top of a hill, as far as the eye can see, there will be small patches of cannabis growing as they have for the last 700 years. And as they are meant to grow, these are the areas in the world. Uh, my colleague from Uruguay mentioned Paraguay, and we know that Paraguay is a traditional growing area that have probably lost a lot of their income for their, from their rural farmers because of the liberalization of the laws in Uruguay. Now, we cannot operate in isolation here in Southern Africa. And for European countries to set the example of putting a limit on plants is, is a direct indication to our South African governments that this is the right thing to do. Now, just to bring it on to a very personal level, my partner Julian was shot. He was murdered in a home invasion at our farm outside Johannesburg in July, 2020. That murder has never been investigated. The police have not even spent five minutes on that murder investigation. And now our government want to use the police to come and put me in jail for having more than four, six, eight, 15 plants. This is taking a crime fighting initiative away from a country that is virtually bankrupt. So my, my, the bottom line of what I'm saying is, is the European Union and the various countries in Europe, North America, Canada, setting the scene for the complete human rights violation of our rural cannabis farmers by continuing to promote this unconstitutional plant counting as a model that is going to be adopted by um, so-called developing countries. Are the people who are making the laws in Europe considering the fact that they are unintentionally setting the bar far too high for the developed countries? So that, that is my question for the panel. We have very, very different circumstances here in South Africa, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, Morocco. Um, and certainly countries in South America, such as Colombia and Mexico. So what I would like to see is please consider us when you have ridiculous laws like four plants per person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, 
I would say nobody knows why just or why exactly three plants here and four plants there and eight plants. Uh, I mean, uh, in other country or, or jurisdiction, we have in the times we have set the limits or the, for the difference between the uh, administrative and criminal offense. We have uh, we have reviewed the evidence uh, on the how those different limits for the personal possession on I mean uh, amount of, 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 of substances or amount of plants for the cultivation for personal purpose how they were set up in different countries and, and jurisdictions and basically there is no real evidence behind that yeah? it's just kind of consensus or it's based on the historical perception of the harmfulness of different drugs in different countries. Yeah? So, I mean, this is, again, the, the very important, uh, important um, uh, fact, uh, I mean, uh, for the decision, whether it's not, or whether it's, it is or it's not a crime, and the evidence behind that is, is very weak, simply. Uh, uh, our colleague from South Africa, of course, asked our colleague from Malta as well to speak about it. But let me say one thing, yes, uh, a couple of things about it. First, uh, I have a meeting with the Minister of Justice on the 15th of May. I hope he's not going to cancel it. Uh, and we said we're going to meet uh, for six hours, three hours with his deputies and, and uh, directors of his departments and then we go having a dinner and talk more and one of the things that we want to talk about uh, one thing is allowing a certain amount of uh, legal production and sale another thing is if it's illegal still illegal without a license or whatever what's going to happen and my proposal is to to uh, to get rid of any criminal sanctions. So even for people who who would be illegal uh, or not legal, not licensed, would have uh, would be without criminal sanctions. But at the same time, we have laws uh, uh, about alcohol, uh, which allows certain amount of home production. And the rest has to be licensed and taxed. So we cannot go totally free with, uh, with cannabis and very restrictive with, with alcohol or, for example, uh, with um, tobacco. Also, the same debate, that's because all, the, all these areas are under my office. We have the same debate about gambling. We have licensed gambling. We we switch internet uh, 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 non-licensed providers off. We last year we switched two hundred uh, non-licensed uh, internet providers of gambling, and uh, again there are high penalties. Uh, money people pay money one uh, uh, thirty thousand so dollars things like that. So uh, in terms of um, market and um, and uh, let's say controlled market and also let's say um, uh, in terms of fair market for those who will follow all the procedures uh, there has to be limitation because if somebody uh, starts planting 200 plants 500 plants and says it's for my own personal use but we know it's probably not because it's so much. So there has to be some way of limiting it, unless we say we are libertarian, libertarian society and there is no no laws. When there, there are laws, we have... So, so yes, we are on one scale, what you're saying, that people uh, would be allowed for plants and then uh, if it's more than four, four plants, you'll be five six ten fifteen years in prison that's uh, that's obviously concept that should be uh, that should should not be there uh, but at the same time we have to protect those who who want to go in the put, invest money 
uh, uh, want to be legal, uh, uh, want to do commercial legal business. Uh, and we have the same problem in my area, uh, where I'm from. We might have similar area, a similar situation in South Africa, I don't know, but um, we have a wine produ producing area. And uh, the, we have two producers, one is legal, and one says, I'm doing it for my own personal purposes. But everybody knows that people go in, in his cellar and buy. So the other one that, 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 that has to follow all the taxation and everything. Licensing. Uh, licensing is, is disadvantaged. So this, these are all questions that have to be also put on top of all. And I, I totally agree with your questions, uh, with your questions of developing country situations, human rights uh, aspect. It's extremely important. All this is important. At the same time, fair market has to be also on the table. Uh, and from my point of view, I'm a therapist. I'm a, uh, I worked initially as a nurse and then a psychotherapist for, for decades and work with people who have addiction problems. I saw people dying of addictions. Uh, I need, and my role in my, in my government as well is to, to, uh, to reduce risks uh, and harms from addiction situations, whether it is gambling or cannabis, whether it is opium uh, or whatever it is, yes. Uh, so regulated market, as we know it from in tobacco, uh, although it supports, and we know it supports big monopolies, at the same time, the epidemic stopped. Uh, so we cannot uh, not have this on the table as well. On top of the situation where when we even start talking, uh, we are accused uh, by, uh, uh, I don't want, even want to say all the accusations. So on one hand, we, we are in the situation where we cannot even move forward. Germany is speaking about uh, legalizing the, the market. And at the end of the day, they say, oh, we cannot do it because European court will not allow us. So we stay alone, Czech Republic, in the whole EU with the proposal. It's going to be extremely difficult for me to, to persuade our ministers now after, after hearing from Germany that they are afraid of going forward, even though they said it before, that we still, as, as the only country, going to go forward with it. So it's, it's all a difficult game. We know it's wrong. Our ministers know it's wrong. We have all the numbers. We decriminalized position for personal use 25 years ago and nothing wrong happened. We stopped it for a while and really wrong things were happening. So we had to go back to decriminalization. So we know it. We have all the numbers. We know what the war on drugs or today's special operation, uh, army operation on drugs costs. Uh, as, as Magda rightly s s says, and, and Magda more. Magda is asking for the floor, yeah? Uh, sorry, 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 yes. <laughs> and, uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing, yes. But at the same time, we are in the reality caught in the politi politics that uh, people are afraid yes, to, to go forward with it. Okay, I'm thinking how to inc integrate the uh, questions or, or notes from the chat uh, into our debate. But anyway, uh, now we have uh, Magdalena and then uh, Julio from Uruguay. So Magdalena, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I actually have a question. Uh, but, but first, if that's okay, I would like to very, very quickly react uh, to, uh, to the previous two speakers. In a lot of respect for the attitude that you take and for the conversations um, in Czechia right now. Uh, I'm very much in favor of the attitude, leave no one behind when you, uh, when you reform. Um, and for that reason, I'm really the fan of talking both about regulation and decriminalization. And this is because even I understand from the examples that, the few examples that we have around the world that even when we uh, regulate the cannabis market, there are still people 
and it would be and it would be lovely to hear from a colleague from from the colleague from Uruguay how it actually looks like um, in the country because what I'm hearing is that still a lot of people a lot of people who use cannabis tend to or decide to uh, buy their drug illegally even when the uh, regulation framework and the and the legal sources uh, exist and for me as the human rights person is it will be important to see that this person who for any reason because of the prices or um because of the uh, geograph geographical location uh, does not decide to go and buy illegally, then he or she still is not treated as a criminal. That's one thing. And also, um, for me as a human rights person, um, I have quite some resistance a resistance towards an idea to treat people like in the law to treat them differently depending on what some substance they decide to consume would it be sugar alcohol um cannabis amphetamine etc i would like to see no one criminalized for that uh, type um, of a choice so a lot of respect and fingers crossed for uh, for Czechia. now to to martel i hear you well um, I'm afraid there is a lot of ignorance and colonial thinking still in, in, in Europe. Um, I'm afraid we won't have good news in the sense that uh, from what we can observe these days, the EU is in different levels and different topics becoming more and more security oriented. That also influences the thinking, the internal EU thinking about drug policy, um, I'm afraid. And even um, when we received at the end of the last year, the document that is called Council Conclusions on Human Rights Based Approach in Drug Policies um, from the Council of European Union. So the human rights document, it is still not as bold as we would like uh, to see that. So this is to, um, in reaction um, to your inter interventions. And right now I would like to ask the question, taking um, uh, the opportunity and having a, a number of experts from different countries on, um, on this bridge. Um, because as, a, as I said, on one hand, we can see a bit more openness towards the human rights um, arguments and to uh, developing and adopting the alternatives to punishment, even at the UN level, uh, which is perceived as the one that is really uh, resistant towards changes. But there is one more group that I'm really concerned about and that presents a lot of resistance to any reforms. And this is the law enforcement. So uh, clearly in many countries, in my home country in Poland, we can see that drug law is a very um, easy and useful tool for, for the police to score higher uh, or to get um, L to get rid of the undesired citizens in a way, uh, to target people, etc. Um, so I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the new drug policies that we would like to see would definitely require the reframing of the, of the role of the law enforcement. And I'm just wondering whether in any of your countries, uh, at the stage of reforms preparations, there has been any, there have been any discussions with the law enforcement, any type of cooperation that would involve them successfully from the very beginning. Um, I know there are good examples, the Frankfurt Way developed years ago in, in Germany, uh, but that was more about like the local level and about the public health perspective about um, about enforcing the, the law, but at the, at the stage of creating new reforms, I'm wondering whether it would be possible to um, to involve law enforcement. Of course, we we hear uh, from uh, from colleagues and experts from LEAP, which is Law Enforcement Action Partnership, the international network of former law enforcement officials who, after serving for years as prosecutors, judges, street cops, undercover officers, um, 
they have realized how much damage they created to um, to individuals' lives, to their families, to the whole communities. And today they speak in favor of um, decriminalization and regulation. But this is a specific group of uh, law enforcement. So my question to all of you is, do you have any good lessons learned, any experience on that matter? Thank you, Magda. Uh, I, I mean, before g giving the floor to others to, to answer your question, I would say, yes, uh, in Czech Republic, the law enforcement authorities are part of our debate for how to design our, our regulation model, and the INSIC can describe uh, further. I would like to come back to your remark on alternatives to punishment. Of course, this is right thing to do, to provide alternatives instead of the, I mean, strong or severe punishment. But for me, it is. it, it was always the interesting thing, kind of paradox or controversial thinking. So first we set up the uh, um, severe penalties and then uh, as, as, as it shows the collateral damages, I mean, so instead of uh, st stepping down and, and decreasing the, the penalties, we are, I mean, introducing complex mechanisms uh, for uh, of alternative uh, treatment or, 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 or measures. Yes, yeah? so uh, I mean, <laughs> um, but but we know, I mean, f as soon as uh, as the as the penalty or the strong law enforcement measure in is introduced, is very difficult to to get rid of that. Yeah? So uh, this is one of the rule, uh, I, I would even say sarcastic rule of the drug policy we have. But uh, we shouldn't forget, we, we have Julio uh, you waiting for... You shouldn't forget for, that you are chair. For, yeah, I, you I, I'm a chair. Become a, you've I'm become a, a panelist as I'm well. A, no, no, sorry, sorry <laughs> for that. So uh, uh, how to deal with that? We have a question f uh, from, uh, from, from Magdalena. Julio was asking for the floor, but it, there was also, I mean, kind Hello, of Julio. a question uh, directly to Julio. So pr please, Julio. Presentenos su, sus comentarios. Sí. Yes. Plan, ¿no? Let's differentiate. <coughs> On the first half, of the, uh, on the first part, on the first, on one side, the discussion or the discussion about the concept of regulating, regulating markets or regulation. On the first hand, I would like to say that international, uh, international organization is a technical, a technical organization, international, that establishes what drugs are, compl uh, um, are more damaging and which ones are not. It, it is there to guarantee the access to medicaments and to certain drugs by the whole population of the world. That is the the role or the aim of of this international organization. They they don't have a a commitment or, or, or a rule that has to be followed by all the countries. They can say Uruguay and Canada is out of all the conventions, out of all UN conventions, but they don't have any possibility to sanction these countries except forbid access to opioids, which is not going to happen anyway. This is an, introdu is an introductory comment to set the discussion. This, these UN mechanisms or UN organizations are technical. They're presented as political bodies, but they are not. They're not the UN Security Council in any, they're not at all. The second point that is important to open the floor for the discussion is which is which is the level of discussion on, on regulation that we want to reach? The UN conventions, for example, UN conventions mention that human rights treaties are above any other treaty or any other agreement. This means that the drug treaties are at a level that is inferior to human rights treaties or conventions. Therefore, the perspective that regulations or laws are 
are worked on within the treaties of human rights or following human rights treaties. There is no possibility that you would be out that any of these laws would be outside the UN UN conventions, UN laws. This is also valid for Europe. If we we set this discussion on the on the base of the conventions of 1961, 1998, we're going to find a lot of difficulties. We're going to face a lot of difficulties. However, if we base our discussions on the basis of the treaties and, and conventions based on human rights, the reality is very different. Therefore, this is our basic, our basis for discussion, our main point, starting point. This is something that we found ourselves in our discussions in Latin America in general in 2002, 2013, and in Uruguay in particular, to set a rational discussion in the framework of international right or international laws in line to what we were doing. There's always somebody, some technical person, some professional, some expert who comes and it gives his opinion and has an opinion, whichever it might be. But Uruguay is not outside the conventions, it's not outside international law, international conventions. Uruguay develops its politics and its policies within the framework of human rights conventions and human rights uh, laws, um, conventions that are to do with, with public health which have a high point to, um, to other, other conventions. If we look at this, if we look at the transformation of political of drug policies only in line with, to follow UN, UN conventions, we come to a, to, a, to a close point. We're not going to get anywhere. For a more practical discussion, or to, to set up the basis for a more practical discussion. The definition of regulations, who gives them? Who provides these definitions? Is it the market? Or, or the, the, the main role is played by the governments, by, by the states? There was an issue that we had to discuss a lot in Washington with a number of politicians and, and academics from the US, which said that regulation was not possible because we couldn't, because we couldn't uh, tame, we couldn't stop freedom of expression, we couldn't regulate uh, um, markets without regulating marketing. So this is false. It depends on how each country and the realities of each country, the, the constitutional legal realities of each country, and how the norms or how the laws are applied in each country, without going against freedom of expression and to say we cannot promote the sale and marketing of tobacco, of marijuana, this might be a problem for the US and the Constitution. However, this is not a problem for Uruguay. In Uruguay, promoting tobacco is very strictly forbidden in all its versions, all its forms, and, the, and promoting marijuana is also forbidden also on internet, even on internet. It's more difficult to control, but it is forbidden. We need to define in, in our discussion whether regulation is, is, is led by the market itself, inclu including the promotion or the and marketing of these substances, or the government is going to play a key role in this in line with human rights and public health and then develop a regulation with, with very strict governmental presence, which has nothing to do with regulating the market. And this is, uh, there are a number of other things that our colleague from the Czech Republic said. In Uruguay, we have the same with wine. You can produce it for your own consumption. There are certain limitations. I cannot sell it. 
¿Por qué? Porque el vino que yo Why? puedo hacer, can... de, de las vides, de las parras que tengo en mi casa, I have my vineyards, no, I produce them, no make one, and it has no control in terms of yo puedo, yo puedo to be sold. I can, I can become intoxicated by drinking this wine. But I cannot intoxicate a third person. I can intoxicate myself, but not a third person. I would be, I would be committing a crime or a, a, in public health. With cannabis, is the same. I can, go, I can produce cannabis for my consumption. Eventually, there may be somebody who wants to consume what I'm producing in Uruguay from the six tons that I have. The possibility. But it is different to me being able to sell it. For me to sell any product, be it wine or any other product uh, that comes from the ground, from the field, obviously this, these products have to have certain controls that state that these products don't have any any oxidants, any any contaminating substances pesticides so here we need to to link together very finely very and tune it together fine-tune things together what we're doing what we're doing one thing is one person would do for would produce for themselves for himself herself and they don't sell it and the other another question is they're going to produce it to sell it if they produce it to sell it we have some people like that in Uruguay obviously they need to have certain control which is very strictly controlled by, by health ministries or health authorities. And they need to pay taxes, and they need to have a, a number of conditions that make this possible, this sale possible. I'm comparing these two clubs, and, and those who, who produce for themselves. The clubs also need to follow certain laws that don't follow these same strict rules by consume for themselves but they don't the clubes do not produce to be sold outside for the third person to consume they cannot buy and consume themselves and maybe i'm finally not to extend myself too much but if we don't organize the discussion in specific levels at specific levels or the right correct levels we are confusing the different elements of the of the of the discussion of the, the different components of the discussion a final point that was on the table a little while ago is whether six eight fifteen plans whether this is arbitrary or how this was determined in Uruguay it has to do with the basic idea it was never the, the use of drugs was never forbidden. It was never was never forbidden. The use of drugs. This is a contradiction in the fact that it is not forbidden because it's an individual act decided by the person themselves, himself, herself. But it is forbidden, or it is regulated how the person access the preparation of this drug or how the person accesses that what they're going to consume in a legal manner. They I can consume marijuana, cocaine, synthetic drugs, but I don't have legal mechanisms to access this. What we did was to regulate the market that already existed, which was marijuana, which had very favorable conditions. The risks were controllable, and what we do was regulate how people could could legally access this drug, cannabis, in these three forms: pharmacies, self-growing, uh, and clubs. It's very important to, to put in order the, in this discussion the different points, and maybe to close my my intervention. Why the six plants in Uruguay? It is because it is understood that with six plants, one can produce enough for themselves. It's not an arbitrary maximum, but it's a possible maximum of 40 grams per month to consume him or herself. This is different to what happens in the US, in, in North America, in the market, North American market. North American market allows the person to consume up to 28 grams, is one ounce, daily, which is impossible. 
Here we could analyze the, American, the North American market, which is much more complex. However, in our case, we allow 40 grams per month, 10 grams a week, which is what is permitted in the legal market. This, uh, some analysis was done. And one person who has six plants, is, is, they can produce approximately 480 grams per year. If they produce, if they produce it in the field, if they produce it or, or, or in house, it doesn't matter. They can produce up to 480 grams per year for the per, for the personal consumption. If somebody has more than nine plants in Uruguay, this is responding to the South, that South African colleague. In Uruguay, the regulation decided on a system, a legal system, a legal system process, which is the Institute of Regulation and Control of Cannabis, which is the only one that can access the houses, can go to a person's house, home, or to a club or or to a company uh, producing cannabis and they do different controls, con controls of quality, controls of quantities, different kind of controls. So what happens here in our legislation? What happens in our legislation? If a person, instead of having six plants, they have eight or they have ten, it is not considered a, a penal or a penalized uh, crime, but an administrative error, which means that the license can be removed. There is a depenalization, de 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 decriminalization, direct depenalization. So what happens to the police and all the law enforcement agencies and the justice system? This is very complex to manage, very complex to handle. The previous government had a strong relationship there was a strong relationship between the associations of consumers and producers of cannabis and the police force and the law enforcement, and there was a, a poli police uh, a system of control that was very advanced and cooperation in, in a way. This government is much more inclined towards the right. It's an ultra-right, stream right government, even though this this legislation was not revoked, the police are the ones who are controlling at the moment the, the, the clubs and the producers. Some lays were not changed, but they were adapted a little bit that permitted the police to access these, these homes and these clubs in a restricted manner. However, the problem we have with our, with our judicial system is very is not inclined to change, obviously, doesn't, doesn't act. And they, they apply certain laws which are not even current, just uh, the judges um, penalize, extremely penalize people when it's, when it's only an administrative penalization that should have been given. So they're more strict than they should be. And I'm sorry, thank you for listening. I'm sorry for my long intervention. Yeah, thank you very much. I believe it was a partial answer also to the issue raised by, by Magdalena, how to deal with the uh presence of the licit and <laughs> illicit part of the market and how to how to punish uh, those who who, uh, uh, who get the cannabis from this illicit part yeah how to change it so uh, i guess this is part of any uh, uh, regulation effort to think about that and also to to adjust yeah, to to have the uh, penalties proportional. So uh, we, we have heard about uh, about Uruguay. Any 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 comment to that? We we have uh, plenty of of comments uh, uh, also on this issue in 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 the in the in the chat. Uh, no. There is there is also uh, in, I mean interest uh, in the chat. Uh, uh, um, I mean, in, in, in comparing or integrating different substances or, of, or, or supply of, of different substances, alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis in one 
framework and, and to think uh, about that uh, in some kind of comprehensive way. I'm not, I'm not reading the concrete remarks or questions, but, but remarks around, around that are here. Uh, and uh, or about the different harmfulness of, of substances which are, which are regulated differently. Again, we, we are here in this legal, illegal uh, substances and, and so on and so on. Uh, Indrich. You would like to raise some some point or, or, or question? Uh, are there any questions in the in the online chat? Well, the, the, there are remarks uh, saying, of course, indeed, in in, in this UN uh, sixty one uh, convention, there is no difference between one percent, two percent, twenty percent of of cannabis. By the way, I feel there is Kenzie listening to us in, in the audience and putting some of those remarks here, yeah, on on, on that. Uh, Mm, uh, Kenzie Ribulet was was mentioned by uh, Kathleen uh, and Magdalena maybe. Uh, oh, yeah, I'll who uh, Indrik, please? Well, just just to uh, to add to to the comment or question of of Magdalena, changing the role of the law enforcement of the police, the courts, and everything. It's it's necessary. <coughs> Uh, that's why I'm saying that we want to remove not all, but most criminal sanctions. It's not easy because against we banging against the European law apparently, uh, as the legal advisors are telling us, because uh, how to how do we define organize uh, international crime comparing to somebody planting. Uh, I don't know, uh, 20, uh, 20 plants in their garden for small sale, but selling it to, to the neighbor country, for example, is it organized crime? Uh, and, and sometimes our police in Czech Republic uh, creating cases of three people, one in wife and husband and their friend, uh, organizing some uh, sessions with psychedelics or 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 or, or uh, planting a few uh, few uh, plants of uh, of cannabis selling into to different country or people from different countries coming and it's it's uh, it's uh, it's sanctioned eight years in prison for example which is very high in Czech Republic because it's considered as organized international crime yes so uh, yes, we need to distinguish from uh, mafias uh, that uh, uh, work with child uh, prostitution, child pornography, selling people, uh, um, uh, abducting people, uh, murdering people and selling drugs at the same time. As, uh, and these people have to, and we have to have criminal sanctions staying there. And, but the rest should be, in our view, in some of our view, uh, some of us who advise into the current government, uh, removed. So we should have administrative sanctions, uh, even for people who will, after we have legal market, but will still be outside of the legal framework. Uh, I, if it's not a real international organized crime, then uh, we should remove criminal sanctions and have other sanctions unless you produce something that kills somebody, for example, or harm somebody uh, 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 in the health wise. So, but this is a very difficult quest. Uh, and of course, as I said, we're going to talk about it with the minister and, and his people and uh, work on it uh, uh, separately. Uh, from from the uh, from the uh, process of of regulated market with cannabis, and we want to look at not only cannabis in this matter. We had I just want to mention recent case that raised attention of the whole uh, public in Czech Republic uh, of two people who were imprisoned, husband and wife, Polish people who were imprisoned. So we call it uh, Cordis case uh, uh, for eight years for uh, organizing rituals for uh, for uh, uh, 
Uh, ayahuasca retreats. Ayahuasca retreat. Uh, uh, sentenced as, as organized crime, uh, international organized crime, and it, it raised a rage of, of the public against this decision, and it ended up in presidential pardon. So these people were released at the end of the day. But that set a case for the debate in the Republic that we have to think about the whole, whole area of criminal sanction and reframing and, re and changing the role of the law enforcement. Yeah, this is not only the question how the law is, is, is written, but also how it's processed and what evidence is taken into account when speaking about aggravating circumstances and so on, Magdalena for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, when and people, all, all when people are in front of the court for, for drugs, they're already sentenced. So, before, before the court, it's, so it's a very different situation. So I think uh, we need to, to and human rights, view of course in this matter is extremely important sorry for yeah. being long yes we we have uh, some remarks about limits uh, of thc content and so on but i, I would say uh, we will f uh, probably at this initial stages of, of our uh, uh, regulation efforts we will have to have different limits for for active compounds for for number of plants here and there and so on so we we have discussed that that a lot uh, we have three minutes to the end so uh, please uh, let's make a final round uh, with final I'm statements, one, two sentences uh, before I will thank to all of you and to all participants in audience. Uh, let's start uh, here in, in our studio. Let's start in the Okay, I didn't want to say more, more, but okay, I think prohib uh, prohibition should end. It's against uh, humanity. It's cruel. It's uh, harmful doesn't uh, doesn't bring any doesn't bring any preventative uh, outcomes that we need we need to look at different options I think from the prevention point of view uh, we need to look at regulated market uh, Myrtle please Hello, thank you. Yes, my closing arguments would be, um, please don't forget about us here in Africa. I am very often on the international stage, very much alone. There's no other civil society organizations uh, dealing with the cannabis issue outside of South Africa and Africa's vast continent. And the unintended consequences can either come from your government's regulation setting the bar too high for developing countries, or or other, other uh, ways that you can really affect our traditional communities in Africa by um, coming to invest in cannabis in, in Africa. And that can certainly, and we are seeing it happen already, result in the colonial capture of our traditional cannabis. So if, um, uh, if you can just please consider that, working to your various governments and your parliaments, that we don't want these un unintended consequences, uh, but we certainly do uh, thank you very much for, for always including us in these conversations. Thanks. Thank you, Myrtle. It was also important remarks here in chat along those lines, so uh, about this responsibility of Western countries. Andrew, please, the last one, two sentences. <laughs> Yes, so um, I think it's very nice to see the honesty of the Germans and the Czech Republics coming out um, and stating that they wanted to pursue a commercial market um, with Germany maybe backtracking a little and now we're waiting for you in the Czech Republic to make this bold move and we're all behind you and we know um, in our opinion I think that it is the Czech Republic that should be carrying the flag because they have decriminalized such a long time ago. So we are basically just getting up to your level at the moment. Um, so obviously we have a little bit more um, exciting things happening, which is the creation of these associations and the setting up of an agency which has um, released ver various directives on how you can participate in, in having an association. There's um, more than eight directives, uh, some are the you know, notes to the application to cultivate, harvest, store, package, transport and distribute. 
and it gets very technical and obviously at the same time bars certain individuals usually people that have been affected by the war on drugs from participating so i hope that people um, countries moving forward will take note and make sure to keep in touch with civil society especially people that do use substances because they know what they want and they know what they need and um, if you work together you will definitely come up with a better solution thank you thank you andrew for participation georg please your turn yeah, it's a pity that it's uh, already over. There are a lot of uh, open ends uh, left uh, now. I would uh, like to contribute to the police question, how to deal with police and those um, repressionists there um, and their influence, because I also th think it's uh, the biggest player against legalization, as in Germany at least. Um, well, but no time left. Uh, and I would also hear more about um, Malta and the problems in the details of the regulation of the clubs. Maybe we can uh, go to direct talks also after this. Uh, also with uh, the Czech colleagues, uh, it would be very interesting to talk about some more details. Now it's just um, time to wish you good luck and stay stronger than the German government did. Uh, and uh, well, I hope you um, def at the end pave the way for all Europeans to legalization. Thank you, Georg, and uh, I hope there will be continuation of, uh, of the debate. We would like to continue with those debates because uh, we see it's, it's useful and needed. Please, Julio, last words from Uruguay. Uh, <coughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. I think this debate and this, this it's not the only the only time I've met some of you in, in UN, UN debates. In order to continue this forward, to move this forward, we have to continue this debate. We have to gain further knowledge, give space to politicians and politics, um, even include the civil society. It is very relevant, and the other ones who have a, to play, play a key role in this process, in this discussion. I am open to continuing any debates, to cooperating. It's been very pleasant to discuss with you, to listen to you, and to share this moment with yourselves, even though it is really early in the morning here in Uruguay. <laughs> we, are, we are sorry for the... Uh, Magdalena, please. Thank you, thank you. So we discussed different attitudes, like what penalties, what should be legal and illegal. Let me just say that I would really like to see uh, as little penalties in the drug policy as possible and really reserved for the for the organized uh, crime. So I hope we'll manage to create the situations around the world when the law enforcement and police officers have completely no interest in stopping and searching people's uh, pockets um, on, the, on the streets. So in the legal term, I, um, I keep fingers crossed for uh, the regulation of cannabis that would, of course, leave no one behind. So would uh, have the racial justice, social justice components. Uh, I very much hope an advocate for decriminalization. Uh, and so this is on the legal level. In addition to that, let's remember that drug policy is also education prevention. So people who use drugs do not um, develop uh, disorders. Uh, then we need to have wide range of um, treatment uh, methods and last but not least accessible available harm reduction which is unfortunately often treated as something of a minor, minor importance while it may be a really life-saving uh, thing so thank you very much for having me and human rights perspective in this conversation Thank you, Magdalena. It is very important indeed. Uh, there is no more words needed from, from me. Uh, we are slightly over the time. Uh, I would like to thank especially you, uh, panelists, for, for being here with us. Uh, for, 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 the, in the morning. <laughs> for, the, for, for the discussion. Uh, we are in studio in city of Brno. You can see on the background of, of the studio the pictures from from Brno. Uh, Is it I would like to from Prague. <laughs> well, <laughs> it should be Brno. Huh? Uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, also participants in the audience uh, for the questions, remarks, for listening to us, and uh, 
As Georg said, uh, it's, a, it's a pity, uh, but it's, it's not the last opportunity. We would like to continue with uh, this kind of, of debates. Uh, so, uh, on behalf of our think tank, uh, Institute for Rational Drug Policy, I would like to thank you again and to invite you for the next uh, discussion and we will inform you uh, um, in the right time. <laughs> so, thank you very much, take care, uh, have uh, a lot of energy for what you do, and goodbye. Bye-bye to everybody who's listening to us to, uh, on online as well. Uh, and I would like to, we should thank to our interpreter from Spain to English and vice versa, Marisa Pereo, who is sitting over there in the studio, so thank you, Marisa. Goodbye.